How's everybody doing this morning? Uh, Joel 2.32 says that it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Paul reemphasizes that for us in Romans 10.13 where he says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So in light of that, let's sing Mighty to Save. Holland. We are delighted to have each and every one of you here today. Um, if you're visiting with us, if you would look in the seat pocket of the chair in front of you, there should be a white visitor's card there. If you would fill that out, that way we have a record of your attendance. We'd appreciate it. There's also an orange card there in the seat pocket chair in front of you, and that is a prayer request card. If you have anything that we need to pray for you about, if you would fill that out, and put, it in the put it in the offering plate as it goes by. We'd be in prayer for you as well. Just a few announcements this morning. Uh, there will be a um, children and youth mission or uh, ministry vision meeting. It will be following service today. Lunch will provi be provided. If you did not sign up, it is okay. Please still come. There will be plenty of food for everybody. Uh, Jeremy's got a great slideshow presentation ready to go and a bunch of information to be given. 
So please, Cowboys already played. So you don't have to go home and stay here today. Um, so um, if you're uh, interested in that, please feel free to stay. Uh, the Baptist Women will meet Monday, October the 7th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. All the ladies are invited to meet uh, with them, so put that on your calendar. That is October 7th at 6 p.m. There will be a leadership, leadership team meeting. We Sunday, October the 13th. That will be following the morning worship service, and lunch will be provided there as well. So if you are a committee chair or a leader in any capacity, please put that on your calendar so we can start planning for 2025. Um, we're looking for greeters every Sunday morning. There's a sign-up book in the back if you're interested in being a door greeter. Please fill that book out or see Mr. Raleigh Bell. Also, the food pantry is always looking for monetary and food donations. Numbers have continued to increase, serving 36 about two weeks ago. Also, this money uh, goes to provide weekly backpacks for 40 students at FBC Hall, or not FBC Hall, at Holland ISD. Um, so that's awesome. Those kids... Uh, get to have a meal throughout the weekend where they may not have that, and uh, so you're providing that. It's an awesome, awesome effort that they continue to do. Um, the food pantry is held the third Thursday of each month from 2 to 4. Also, Thanksgiving is coming up, so um, they're going to be needing things uh, for Thanksgiving, so there's a list in the foyer in the back, so if you're wanting to give to that, please do. Uh, the clothes closet is currently in need of gently used blankets, quilts, and sheets. You can bring those items to the church office Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to noon, or you can see Mr. Main Spin or Marie Call to donate those. Uh, the closed closet is open the third Thursday of each month from 2 to 4, as well as the first Saturday of each month from 9 to noon. Um, it'll be open this Saturday, I believe, from 9 to 12 as well. So all those items are free. Uh, if you know someone that's needing anything, uh, please fe feel free uh, to come this Saturday, 9 to 12. The Deacon of the Week this week, Mr. Teddy Gaines. Mr. Teddy Gaines. There's his number there. It could be your first contact. If you need anything, please feel free to reach out to Mr. Teddy. Also, October the 5th, this coming Saturday, will be the Men's Breakfast Saturday. Please put that on your calendar. Okay, Men will start cooking at 6.30. Do not arrive before then because Rex will be making biscuits. And you cannot find out the secret recipe to those, so you have to come to figure it out. Um, huh? I need a new joke? No, do you not know those biscuits? They're amazing. You just whop them on the counter. That's a good, that's still a good one. You got to come. <laughs> I'm also planning on some work possibly that Saturday, so looking forward to doing that. that. Uh, personage is coming along, so uh, possibly be working on that as well uh, this coming Saturday. So please put that on your calendar, October the 5th. And if you would, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, dear Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for this church and this place that we have to come and, and worship more about you. We just ask that you be with Pastor Jeremy as he brings your word uh, from Acts this morning. And we just continue to look forward to dive in and, and hear more uh, about you through Pastor Jeremy. We just ask that you continue to bless him, continue uh, to bless the Bell family, and we're, we're so thankful for them and, and everything that they mean to us. Um, we just ask that you be with those who are sick and those who are afflicted, just continue to watch over them, and we just ask that you be with us as we go throughout the rest of this worship service, that we do it in a manner that is pleasing unto you, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's continue to sing together, Blessed Be the Name. We'll pour a thousand tongues to the sea. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For the glories of my God and me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Jesus, the name that comes my dear. Blessed be the name of the Lord.
scripture with us. And I'm going to pray after she does it. Good morning. Uh, we're going to be reading from Acts 2. Right? 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. 
selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Lord, we're thankful for this word um, and what it says to us, Lord. May we continue to follow you, trust you, gather together to um, break bread together, to share your word and to share our lives and community, Lord. And may we never take that for granted and may we always take advantage of it every chance that we get. And we're thankful for allowing us to be here this morning for this worship time that we might truly worship you in the spirit and the truth. And Lord, as we take up our offering this morning, we pray that you use it for your glory and for the building up of your kingdom. And we just thank you for the salvation that comes through Jesus. And we ask it all in his strong name. Amen. This will be our offering time, so if you're going to help take that up, you can come forward. And we're going to sing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a rich like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Oh, my, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear and raised my fears with me. How precious blood that grace. The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been so free My God, my Savior Ransom me Like a flood With mercy rain Unending love the Lord has promised good His word, my hope secure. He will my shield and portion me as long as life endures. my soul ransom me like a flood in mercy rain unending love amazing rain the earth shall soon dissolve like sun the sun Better shine the God who called me below will be forever mine when we've been there ten thousand years God shining as the sun. Thank you for your grace. 
And we look forward to the eternity when we can sing your praises forevermore. We're thankful that you call us to yourself, Lord, and, and may we be open to that call, whether it be a call to salvation, whether it be a call to follow you. Uh, just, just give us the faith to follow you and to be all that you want us to be, Lord. And we lift up Pastor Jeremy as he comes and brings us your word that we may, by your Holy Spirit, take it into our lives and that we might live it out each day. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, so before I, before I really get going, uh, let me just ask a clarifying question. Are, uh, are the crickets always this bad here in Holland, or is that like a... I walked in this morning, I'm like, is God plaguing us or something? Because I just wanted to know. I was like, goodness gracious, they are everywhere. Um, so I'm glad to hear that that's a, that's a normal thing. Well, let me, uh, let me start by giving you uh, a little update. So as you remember, uh, our last our business meeting that we had at the beginning of this month, uh, we were talking about the sale of the land in the back here, that three acres that's off the, kind of behind the fence back there. And uh, we didn't have any offers at the time. Well, I am here to tell you today that we have, on Monday of this week, our trustees uh, signed that land over, and a little over $122,000 has hit our building uh, account in, the, uh, in, our, in our, whatever, account there in the building ground. So we've sold that land, praise God, and uh, we got all that, all that money in there, so we are super grateful. Listen, the Lord is just super grateful gracious and generous to this body of believers. I hope you understand that what's happening here isn't normal. Like, this isn't just normal church. Like, this, like God is showing us favor and blessing in these days, and so I, I just hope you understand that the Lord is not only amazing, uh, but the Lord is among and with us right now. Amen? And let me just remind you, if you're a guest here with us today, I just want you to know we're thankful and glad that you're here. I'm Pastor Jeremy. Uh, I serve as the pastor here at FBC Holland, but we exist, just so everybody knows, we exist uh, as a movement to draw people closer to Jesus and deepen their walk of faith with Him. And so we are a movement of disciple-making disciples. So with that, I want to pray and just say thank you to God for His blessings in our, in our church, uh, His blessings in what He is doing right here before our very eyes. So would you pray with me now? Uh, Father, we just thank you so much uh, for just the answer to those prayers that many of us have thrown up to you about that land sale. And we just thank you that it happened so quickly, and Lord, that uh, everything went well and smooth, and that our trustees were able to uh, finalize that document on Monday. And Lord, I'm just so grateful that you are continuing to bless us. And as Psalm 67 says, may, not you, only, may, may you just not only bless us, but in that may we use the blessings that you have given to us to be a blessing to others. That we use these resources as a means to advance your kingdom and glorify your great name. We want to be a people on, on a mission. We want to be a people on a movement of disciple-making disciples from here to the ends of the earth. So, Father God, I pray now that you would speak to us through your word as we pick up in Acts chapter 2. Uh, Father, just speak for your servants are listening today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you have your Bible. Meet me in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 40. To is where we will be this morning. Now, let me catch everyone up, just in case you didn't know. Let me kind of catch you up to where we are today. So, prior to this, Jesus has just resurrected from the grave. He calls his disciples together, and he gives them a mission. He says, you are going to be a movement. You are going to, when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you are going to be my witnesses from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. And then he told them to go to Jerusalem and wait. And so they are in Jerusalem, and they are waiting. And last week, we saw the Holy Spirit descend on God's people. We saw Peter stand up and preach a sermon to thousands of people. And in that, we saw 3,000 people get saved in the text. And at that moment, this church has grown, if you will, from 120 to over 3,000 people. But what I want you to see is that the Holy Spirit that is at work, the Holy Spirit that is working in this text is the same Holy Spirit who is at work amongst us today. I mean, last week we got to baptize two people. Last week we thought three people will give their lives to Christ by raising their hand and two others want to respond in baptism. One of them is probably going to get baptized next Sunday. And I want you to understand that the Holy Spirit movement that we see in Acts chapter 2 is the same Holy Spirit movement that God is giving in us to see today. Amen? Like it's still happening. This movement is still going. 
And I want you to understand that there's not much time between verse 41, when those 3,000 souls were added, and verse 42. In fact, we're going to see here what the church does in this time of Holy Spirit-empowered movement of disciple-making disciples. You see, verses 42 to 47 is kind of like a child coming home from school. I call this the beauty of and, all right? Have you ever, have you ever had a little child come and talk to you before? And, and, and their story is like this, and, 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 and. I mean, it's like a super fast and story. In fact, the reason why I say verses 42 through 47 is the beauty of and, because the word and is found 16 times in this text. It's kind of like the church's innocence comes about in this movement. So, so here, let me put it to you in a, in a way that you would understand. So when my children, one of our children comes home, this is kind of what they sound like. When I walk through the door after my day of work, they say, well... I got in the car, and I went to school, and I saw my teacher, and I gave my teacher a hug, and my teacher taught me the letter B, and I laid down for a nap, and when I woke up, I got a gummy bear, and I got on purple, and I got in the car with mom, and I came home, and now I'm talking to you. Like, that's, that's just how these conversations go. By the way, if you don't understand the purple reference, let me just, because you maybe not have a kid that's kind of color-coded in their behavior, uh, purple is like you excelled for the day, all right? You, you, did, you went beyond expectations. Orange means like you met expectations, and yellow means that you have some behavior issues to work on, or in the words of one of my children, when they get yellow, it's like yellow's my favorite cover, so I was just going after it. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, my child, all right? But, but that's the beauty of and. It's and, 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 and this text is going to show us 16 different ands. This, 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 this text is going to show us that this movement takes off. But here's what I love that this text offers us as a church. You see, many churches can experience growth. Like we're seeing a, a God-given movement of growth. But typically what happens when churches experience growth, you have like kind of one of two thought processes. Some churches, when growth comes, they're going to turn into a form of institutional maintenance. So they're going to start thinking, like, how do we do systems? And how do we do structures? And how do we get Sunday schools and support and all these different things? things. But I, want to, I want you to understand that the early church didn't think that way. The early church didn't think in terms of institutional maintenance. You see, when the, when the church grew by 3,000, they didn't gather together and be like, okay, we need a youth pastor. Let's get us a worship pastor. Let's start a building campaign. Let's find us a worship space. Let's figure out how many worship services we're going we're gonna to have. Or let's get some constitution. Let's get incorporated. And I'm not saying those things are bad. I'm just saying in this text, God shows us the main focus of his movement. And the main focus of his movement is not to turn into maintenance of church life. The main focus of this movement is to continue with the movement. It's continuing to be a group of disciple-making disciples. And I think this text shows us what God thinks is most important as he begins to pour out his spirit on his church. You want to understand, like, the church didn't stop growing when they reached 3,000 and 120. In fact, look really quick at the very end of verse 47. It says, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, I want you to take, if you take nothing else away from my sermon today, take this away. Movements that mentally shift to institutional maintenance will eventually die and become monuments. Movements that mentally shift to institutional maintenance will eventually die and become monuments. J.D. Greer says, movements move, and the mission was given before the church even gathered. Listen, what came first in Acts chapter 1? Was it the mission or the gathering of the church? It was the mission. You see, God is a missional God. God is on mission to draw people closer to himself through the good news of Jesus Christ. And that's the movement that we have joined as God's church. The, the mission came before the people gathered. You see, the church, God didn't just build his church and was like, okay, well, I guess I better give him something to do. Let's give him a mission to reach the entire world with the good news of Jesus Christ. No, no, no. That was the mission before the church even gathered. And so I want you to see this morning that we need to be a church that maintains itself as a spirit-led movement of disciple-making disciples. That we want to see men, women, and children come to Christ right here in Holland. Every man, woman, child hears the gospel here in Holland. 
Every man, woman, and child hears the gospel here in Texas. Every man, woman, and child hears the gospel across this nation. Every man, woman, and child hears the gospel across the globe. Church, I'm asking you to be a part of and join me on this movement and not just move towards maintenance. But you see, this mentality has crept in. It creeps in very quickly. Let me give you an example. When I was in Japan, uh, one of the things that I... I love to do as a missionary, as a short-term missionary, is I love to encourage our missionaries who are on the field. And so I like to talk to all of our missionaries and see how I can pray for them and help them and talk to them. And I had this one missionary, I'll never forget, he came up to me, and he's like, Jeremy, and I mean, he was mad, like fuming mad. He's like, Jeremy, you know what? He said, if, if, if 100 people showed up to this church in Japan next Sunday, they wouldn't know what to do about it. And I was like, okay. Now, let me just be very honest. Like, I'm not the wisest guy in the room. I'm a visionary. Like, I see things, and I said, let's move, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy that likes to motivate and vision cast. I'm not like, I'm like one of those old age kind of guys that just sits and has all these really wonderful things of wisdom. But every now and then, God gives me some wisdom. Every now and then. Okay? And I felt like in this moment, God gave me some wisdom. And I felt like, if you remember that commercial, I felt like the old owl at the Tootsie Roll commercial. You know what I'm talking about? And she asked him, like, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll? Like, that's what I feel like. God gave me that moment. So I'm like, well, here, I'm going to give you an answer in one, a two, a three. And I said, brother, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. I said, most churches in America wouldn't know what to do if 100 people showed up on their doorstep on Sunday. You see, that's not the questions that we need to be asking. The question is not how do we become a, a maintenance factor when God grows His church, this text shows us exactly what we're supposed to do. We just keep being the church. That's what we're, we just keep going with the movement. Let me show you what the church does in their moment of growth. And this is what God is asking us to do as He continues to grow us. Look what it says, starting in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Here it is. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Did you catch what they did? Let me make it as simple as possible. When this growth, this Holy Spirit movement growth happened, here's what they did. They just kept staying focused on God's mission. They just kept leaning into God's presence. They made church a priority. And throughout the process, God continued the movement of growing His church. Listen, I understand the importance of strategy and structure and systems and models. But those do not replace what God has declared to be most important to his church, and that is this. Listen, his mission of making disciples of all the nations. Church, are you willing to join me on this movement? Like, we're already seeing God move. Are you willing to maintain it as a movement, not turn over to maintenance? So this is how we do that. Three things that you're going to see in this text that help us to maintain a movement of disciple-making disciples, to be on mission for Jesus. Number one, the church exalts Christ. The church exalts Christ. Look what it says in verses 42 and 43. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. This word devote, it means to continue to do something with an intense effort. Possibly recognizing that it's going to be difficult. So, the, so God says, I'm, I'm going to continue to make you and move you on the mission of disciple-making disciples from Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the earth. And they said, okay, we're going to devote ourselves then with intense effort to the apostles' teaching. In other words, what they said is, we want to know more about this Jesus that we put our faith in. We want to be knowing more about this Jesus because the more that we know about this Jesus, the more we're going to be able to share that Jesus with others. And as we share that Jesus with others, the more that the Lord is going to add to our numbers day by day. They were about learning about exalting Christ 
so that they could deepen their faith in the good news and share it with others. You see, I think they were like, oh, there's so much more to this Jesus than simply salvation. And the apostles were like, oh yeah, my friend. We have barely begun to scratch the surface. And they were in awe of what the apostles were saying and the apostles were doing because they understood that this was a Jesus movement. And I think that our growth today is happening because this is the heart of God to use us in these moments. God's saying, join me on the mission to reach the nations with the good news of Jesus. We do this through learning more about Christ, which means when we learn more about Christ, we share Him with others. And there's some of you in this room, as you're growing in your relationship with Christ, it's time to join the movement with us and extend out to the ends of the earth. You see, I think the apostles, they were telling them all kinds of cool stuff about Jesus. You know, you know, that, Peter, you know that Peter went to the crowds and said, hey, let me tell you about this time. And we all got scared. We were on this boat, and Jesus is walking on water. Freaked us all out. I mean, we thought it was a ghost. Scared us to death. And Peter's like, but I was the brave one. I said, hey, Jesus, can I come out and walk on the water with you? And Jesus is like, yeah, come on, Peter. And Peter's like, and I stepped out of that boat, and I was walking on water. And Matthew, you know, he chimes in. He's like, oh, yeah, but Peter, let's not forget. When you took your eyes off of Jesus, you kind of you started to sink. And Peter's like, yeah, that did happen. That did happen. And they look at each other and like, well, that's the, per- that's the point. The point is, church, when you continue the mission, don't take your eyes off Jesus. And they're like, oh, yeah, good one. Or like when John and Peter, they're probably sitting there together with the 3,000. And they're like, hey, you know, some ladies came and told us that the tomb was empty. And so me and John, or John and Peter, they're like, we ran, we ran to the tomb. And, 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 you know, in John's gospel, he says that he reached first. The, the, he say, it doesn't say his name. He says, the disciple who Jesus loved, reached the tomb first. Let's be honest, okay? When a man beats another man in a physical act, you're going to let people know, right? You're just going to tell everybody about that scenario. No matter what, how, how it has any bearing on the story, you're like, John was like, and I beat Peter to the temple, and Peter's going to be like, yeah, well, I walked in first. And guess what? When we looked in there, that tomb was empty. And guess what? That tomb is still empty. And they're like, oh, yeah, Peter, oh, yeah, John, what does that mean? They said, listen, because that tomb is empty, we get to join God on mission to reach more people because of that empty tomb. We get to point people to the good news of Jesus who died for their sin and rose again. And that's our call is to point people to see the empty tomb that we got to see. You see, I think they would gather around the disciples and they would tell them about Lazarus and Jesus bringing them back to the grave, saying, hey, the gospel brings people from death to life. I think they would talk about that time that Jesus told them to go and make disciples of all the nations in Matthew chapter 28, and they were to be his witnesses. And I think that they would say to that 3,000 plus church, you go now and do likewise because you belong to the kingdom of God through faith in Christ and have been empowered by his spirit. In other words, you go share this Jesus with others. You see, the church just kept on being the church by exalting Christ. And when that happened, it said, all came upon every soul as the apostles' words and deeds, and the spirit and power movement continued to bring in more souls. You see, when we come to know Christ, as a Christian, we begin to sit in all of who he is. And this is one of my biggest issues with the church today in America. We have replaced the all of Christ with the all of self. We are, we, we are in all of ourselves. And when I read the Bible, we should actually not be as in all of ourselves as we think we are. You see, we want to be in all of people's and their performances and their programs. But my question is, church, what happened to just being in all with the infinite, gracious, and glorious Jesus? That is enough to keep us busy for all eternity. In fact, if you aren't in all of Jesus now, then I hate to tell you, you're probably not going to like heaven. Because in heaven, all we're going to do is sit around and be in all of Jesus. We're going to be in his presence. We're going to get to know him forever and ever. See, a healthy all of Christ pushes us to join the movement for Christ. A healthy and growing church is a a church that brings a healthy diet of Jesus to Jesus' people. You know, I have, a, I have a favorite kind of doctor. My favorite, I, you know, there's, a, there's doctors have these things called bedside manners, you know. I like the doctor with no bedside manner. 
Just give it to me straight, man. Like, don't beat around the bush. Just give it to me straight. I had a doctor recently about three years ago. Let me tell you why I like these kind of doctors. This doctor three years ago, he came up to me, and he's like, hey, Jeremy, you know you put on some weight. I was like, yeah, you know, I put on a few pounds. He's like, no, Jeremy, you're like, you're like one cookie away from being fat. It's like, oh, well, this is a real, real eye-opener for me. It's a real wake-up call. He's like, I, and he said, the next time I see you, I need you to lose 10 pounds. And I was like, you got it, sir. That message sparked me to move. I mean, I started eating right. I started, I started working out. And next time I went and saw him and I got, I got on the scale, he was like, all right, good job, Jeremy. I'm glad to see that you lost some weight. You see, here's the point. The point is that a healthy diet of Jesus generates a movement in us. As we begin to consume Christ in our worship gatherings and in our Sunday schools and in our quiet times, we're getting a healthy diet of Jesus. And that healthy diet of Jesus, it causes us to move for Christ and reach others with this Jesus that we are in all of. See, sometimes we need a healthy dose of reality that says, hey, church, if you want to be a movement of disciple-making disciples, you better have a healthy diet of Jesus every time you come together. We need to be devoting ourselves to the teachings of the apostles. It's about being in awe of Jesus and the miraculous work that he is doing in people's lives, like when we saw Lincoln and Tyler get baptized. When we see people growing in their relationship to Jesus. When we see marriages healing. When we see children becoming faithful followers. And the list goes on and on and on. But that movement comes only as we exalt the goodness and the glory of Jesus every time we gather together. Are you in all of him? Because when you're in all of him, you'll begin, you'll, then you're beginning to reach all of them. The more all we are of Christ, the more willing we are to go and to live our lives on mission for Jesus. And that's why Paul t- or, uh, Luke tells us in verse 47b, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. A healthy dose of exalting Jesus will be churches that have their priorities in order. And they will be filled with church members who grow deep in their relationship with Christ and take it upon themselves to be Holy Spirit-empowered witnesses for Christ. This leads us to number two, though. So not only are we called to exalt Jesus, but number two, we see that the church is generous. The church is generous. Look with me in verses 44 through 47a. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Are you ready? Uh Uh-oh. Jesus is about to get into our finances. Let me be as clear as possible. Jesus does save you, but he saves you to transform you. He changes your lives. Now, if you're sitting here and you're new and you're a guest with us, I praise God that you're here. Understand this is how I teach the Bible. I go verse by verse. And so I didn't plan to preach on generosity. It just showed up in Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 44 through 47, okay? So we don't do this all the time. We only do it when the text tells us to do it. But the, the gospel is declaring us about being free and forgiven in a right relationship with God, but it also brings about life change, which includes how we manage our finances to see more people come to Christ. Let me put it this way to you, Christian. Every dollar, every dollar we have, God has given to us so that we can give one of them a mission. You give every single dollar a mission when you use it. So you give a a mission to eat Your dollars have a mission to have a roof over your head. Your dollars have a mission to save. But also, your dollars have a mission to give towards the advancement of the kingdom. What did they do? When they met Jesus, they're like, hey, we got this stuff. Let's give it to these people so that the cause of Christ can continue to extend beyond ourselves. Did you know that Jesus taught more on money than he did on heaven? In fact, there are 2,350 verses that talk about money. This is twice as many verses than faith and prayer combined. Money is an extremely important topic. 
And the reason is that money has a way of controlling us. You see, money is one of those gifts from God that can really mess us up. Money has a way of waking, making us feel like uh, making you feel things that will push against your money being on mission. But when you have a lot of money, that large amount can make you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, like a false sense of security. Let me give you an example. When I was a next generation pastor, uh, one of the things I would do is I would go and I'd work the nursery during the worship time with uh, about four other people because we had a big nursery. And there was always this little boy. He's, he's, he's a big boy now. I know his family very well. And he would always carry this nasty, worn out, filled with boogers, blue blanket. And I mean, he'd hook that thing like this and he would walk around with that blue blanket. It was his safety blankie. You ever, had a, you ever had somebody that has a safety blankie? Well, this was this kid, man. He had a safety blankie, and he felt safe as long as he had that blankie. And he would come into the room, and we'd give him his safety blankie, and he would cry for a little bit, and then he'd be all good to go. Now, what would, what would happen if I tried to take that safety blankie away from him? You think he'd be happy with me? No, he, he'd want to fight me, right? And, and thankfully, if I, if I wasn't bigger than him... And he probably would whoop me, all right? I guess just to be honest. He's like, you ain't taking my blankie. But you see, this is how some Christians view money. It's a, they view it as a little blankie that makes them feel all safe and secure inside. And they're like, I'm refusing to give this to advance God's kingdom. Others, others feel a satisfaction with money. Money has a way of making us feel satisfied, fulfilled, right? Because money can buy us things that we feel like and think we need in life, money can be used as a means for self-gratification and indulgence. You see, money is not evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil because we can use it to give in to our wants and desires in life. But let's be honest. When is the last time you bought something that left you everlasting satisfaction? I can't remember a time. See, satisfaction comes and goes when we have stuff and we money. Why not then, my question is, why not invest in something that pays eternal dividends? Why not invest in something that brings an everlasting satisfaction that God is going to use to bring people to himself? You see, there's two types of children when you take them to a store and give them some money to buy something. If you give a child $10 and they stick it in their pocket and you say, you can go into this store and you can buy anything you want with that $10. dollars you got two types of kids. Ready? The first kid is the kid that that money is burning a hole in their pocket. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you got that cash, you got to spend it. So they run around that store, and it takes them about five seconds, and they find everything that they want, and they go to the cash register, and they're like, here, here's my $10. Give me my stuff. And then by the time they get from the store to the car, they've lost half of it, right? But then there's another kind of kid. And this is the kind of kid that just peruses for like hours. And it's like, eh, you know, picks it up and kind of looks at it, puts it back. I'm like, yeah, I'm not really interested in that. And by the end of it, they just walk out of the store with the 10 bucks. Why? Because it makes them feel safe. You see, those are, by the way, let me just tell you, this is one of my favorite, this is one of my favorite lessons in premarital counseling. Because in premarital counseling, when you bring two people together to get married, you always have the spender and the saver. And those make for some pretty dicey and fun conversations. Because the spinner's like, yeah, we're just going to buy all this stuff. And the saver's like, no, no, we're not. And then you have to start counseling through the gospel, right? Like, that's why premarital counseling is a big deal. It's very helpful. Uh, if you're ever in need, let me know. But the point is, is that the, notice what the early church did with their money. Look what they did with their resources. It says they were, because of Jesus, they were gladly generous. The text says they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And they received their food with glad and generous hearts. Let me be very clear. This text does not teach socialism or communism. All right? We see the phrase in there that this is their possessions and belongings. It was their property. And the Bible talks a lot about honoring another person's property. How do you know? Because one of the commandments is you shall not steal in other words, you don't take something that doesn't belong to you. This means that possessions are ours, and no one has the right to walk up and take them from us. And we know this internally, don't we? In fact, in fact, if you go to any Texan, seriously, if you go to any Texan and try to take something that belongs to them, I guarantee you that justice will be swift and quick. Right? 
Come take somebody. I got amens. Like we got some Texans in here. You don't, you don't take our stuff. But that's not what's happening in this text. The people are not being forced to give anything. They are responding to the gospel. The gospel made them give their choice to sell their possessions and distribute them throughout the community. Let me be very clear. Listen to me. The gospel changes us to be generous givers. Now, I know some of you, you don't need to hear this, but some of you, you do. The reason that some people are not generous givers as Christians is because either they don't know the gospel or they've distorted the gospel. Now, I know if you're new here today, you're sitting there thinking, you're like, see, I told you. You're like that, you're like that husband or wife turning into each other and going, see, it's all they want is our money. That is not true. That is absolutely 100% not true. Let me give you, let me give you an explanation. Generosity is a result of our belief in the gospel. Let me put it to you in terms of the gospel message, okay? You see, every single one of us in this room, you and I, we are spiritually poor. In fact, we are so spiritually poor that we couldn't even afford the R. We just po. You and I, we po. We spiritually po. We have, we have a crushing amount of debt on us. Our sin... Our sin has caused so much debt that no amount of money could get us out of it. No amount of work can get you out of your sinful, poor condition. That's why God had to send His Son. And God sent His Son to pay our penalty. He paid our sin debt, and that sin debt was Jesus' death on a cross. It was on the cross that God poured out His wrath for our sin on His Son. And it was in that moment that Jesus paid it all for our sin and rose again from the grave. So all who believe in him would have life and life abundantly. See, Jesus is the most generous person on the planet. As one of the great singers I used to listen to said, Jesus didn't tithe his blood. He paid it all, just like the song says. And Jesus paid it all so that you could be given the free gift of grace. You don't have to do anything for Jesus. You just have to believe in Him. He's a free gift that He offers to every single person this morning. And when you understand that generosity in the gospel, when you understand the generosity that Jesus has given to you, then you respond by becoming a generous person. You see, there's a, the most generous people in the church are those who understand that their greatest debt has been paid for by another, and His name is Christ. And this belief in forgiveness generates a response that allows us to be generous to others out of our generosity that Christ has showed us. In other words, what these people understood was that their sins were forgiven and they were willing to put their money into the movement. It's like that sinful woman who finds Jesus. Remember that story about that sinful lady? She found Jesus and she walks into his house where he's sitting and she begins to cry and her tears begin to fall on his feet because of all of her sin. She knows how broken she is. She knows how messed up and desperate she is. She knows how poor she is. She begins to take her hair and she begins to wipe Jesus' feet where those tears had fallen. Then she takes some ointment that was probably very expensive and she pours it on Jesus. And then there's this Pharisee and he's sitting back there and he's like, man, if Jesus just knew who that woman was, he would not let her touch him. He would not let her mess with him because she is dirty, sinful. And Jesus teaches a lesson here. He says, he says, let me ask you something. Who would love me more? The person that I come and I say, you owe me $500, but I've forgiven it, or the person who I come and say, you owe me $50, but I've forgiven it? And the Pharisee says, well, of course, the one who owes you more. And he's like, that's exactly right. And in that situation, this is her. She understands how poor and broken she is. And she has come, she has given, she's, put, she's crying out for, for me to forgive her, say her sins are forgiven, and then in that moment she's going to be generous to me by pouring this ointment on me. You see, those who are most generous are those who see the cost of their sin on the cross. However, those who are not generous either think that their sin debt isn't that bad or that they have no debt at all. Church, understand, the reason that a church becomes generous is because they understand the gospel of generosity. They respond to the gospel of generosity by being generous to advance the message's mission. Now, let me just quickly tie something here. I know I get a lot of people who come up to me and they say, well, who should we give to? Like, as a Christian, where should I give my, my money? Or, and, and listen, if you have a real problem this morning, like if you have some moral scruples about giving, 
All right, like if you're like, I, if you've been manipulated or if you feel like, you know, I don't trust the church, listen to me. I, as the pastor here, don't give here. Don't give to the church if you feel like if that's a moral problem that you have. But give to another organization that is used, being used by God to advance his kingdom. And here's what I pray would happen to you in the future. I pray that you would understand that you can trust us with the money that God gives us to advance his, king, his kingdom and his mission. Uh, listen, we have an, a third, we had an outside party accountant who reconciles all of our accounts. Nobody gets to reconcile those. We, have, we pay somebody out of the house to do that. When we, when we come together, we have a counting team made up of church members who come together, and they count the money for every Wednesday. I don't see any of the money that comes in through the desk. All I see is the report that everybody else sees. In fact, one of the other things we do is one reason we're, we're Baptists is because we vote on budgets. Budget season's coming up. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, finance team. We're excited that you got a lot of work ahead of you. And as a, as a member, you vote towards the budget to make sure that the money that's been given is going towards the mission of advancing the kingdom. So here's, here's the reality. Who do you give to? Well, I say let the Lord teach you on that. But number two, I say this. Give to the church that's ministering to you. Give to the people who are already ministering to you. That Make sure that your money that you give is advancing the mission. And if you're a part of a local church, then give to that local church who's ministering to you and advancing the cause. All right, this leads me to finally number three, which is a pretty quick one. The church made it a priority to gather together. The church made it a priority to gather together. So they exalted Christ, they were generous, and now they made it a priority to gather. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. Here it is. And day by day, they attended the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. You see, the early church just wanted to be around each other. Like, here's a crazy I idea. The church, whose brothers and sisters in Christ, wanted to be together. And so they were together corporately in the temple, and they were together in small groups in their homes. Most likely why they met in a temple is because 3,000 people couldn't meet anywhere else. And number two, they wanted to get together all the time, and so they met in homes. Here's the, here's the thing. Ready? Make it a priority to gather with the entire body of Christ on Sunday. Listen, I know that there are many excuses for not coming to church, like it's too early, I want to sleep in, it's my day off, I just don't want to go, I'd rather do something else. The reason we make excuses is because something's not a priority. You would never use those excuses with your boss, right? Or you wouldn't come up to your boss if you work and you wouldn't be like, hey, you know what, it's just too early, I don't want to come in today. They would be like, okay, you're fired. I mean, many of our children use these excuses for not going to school, don't they? And yet these are the same excuses that we use for not coming. One of my dear friends used to say this. He used to say, Sunday mornings are a Saturday night decision. You decide on Saturday night if you're going to church on Sunday morning. And when you decide on Saturday night, you're going to lay out your clothes, you're going to set your alarm, you're going to have breakfast ready to go. You would get ready just like you would do any other event in your life. You see, the reason we need to gather together is because we need each other. We need to hear our brothers and sisters singing to each other how great their art, how great thou art. We need to be reminded of the gospel of generosity. We need to be reminded of the gospel of grace when we've messed up all week or when, we've, uh, when the devil tries to remind us of our past. We need to see new faces coming through the doors to be reminded that we at once we didn't belong to a community, but through Christ now we belong to a family. Listen, church is not just about you. It's about worshiping Jesus and being encouraged and corrected by those who are also worshiping Jesus. But here's the deal. Corporate worship can only take you so far. Like, my preaching is biblical, but I can only throw it out to you in so many different ways because there's a lot of different people in a lot of different seasons of life right now. Somebody once said this way, preaching is like going into a nursery with a, with a big uh, milk bottle and just spraying out there hoping it lands into the mouths of a few babes. That's what, that's what this is. Like, that's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to spray it out there. We've got some maybe who are lost. We've got some who are immature. We've got some who are mature. And I'm just spraying the gospel all over the place in here, okay? Praise God. Thank you. But then we also need each other in small group communities. That's why they met in homes. Corporate worship needs to be supplemented with small group community. Man, life is hard, right? And the Christian life can be even harder and we are all works in progress. This is why we need a small group of community in the church to help each other in life. And small groups are the places where we can build the closest connections with like-minded believers. 
You see, when life gets hard, it's the people in our Sunday schools that we begin to reach out to. Because Sunday schools are designed to not just to take us deeper in our relationship to Jesus, but to take us deeper in our relationship with each other to help us when times of need. Sunday school is our tight-knit community where we come to meet together at 9.30 in the morning to sit and learn about life. Like, listen, my Sunday school class, which meets at 9.30, we do two things. We laugh a lot, right, Sunday school, and we learn about Jesus. And sometimes we do those simultaneously, okay? But we're here for each other because we want to pray for each other and help each other. But this, this is what happens so often to people in the church. When times get hard or things get rough or when they're going through struggles or sin, they typically want to run from the church and instead run to the church. That's because churches have developed entertainment and individualism and corporate worship and not close connection in small group ministry. So many people think that they have to be perfect to walk through these doors, and that is simply not true. Raise your hand if you're perfect. If you did raise your hand, then now you're a liar, so put it back down, okay? So many people think, so many people think that you've got to have it all together to walk through these doors, and that is simply not true. People think you've got to put on a church face. You don't. We want you to come as you are, and our small groups are to help you walk through whatever life is throwing at you. Man, you know what it is, right? You know how it looks. Husband and wife. You come, in the, you come into church, and y'all are fighting like cats and dogs. She's got mascara running down because she's been crying. Your face is beat red. I see you looking at each other. My, hey, my, my, office is, my office is open for counseling. And then you get, in the call, you get in the parking lot of the church, and you're like, okay, put it together. Right? So she's like getting all the mascara cleaned up, and he's taking his blood pressure medicine to try to get it down. And they walk through the door, and they walk through the door, and that first person comes, hey, how are you doing today? And they're like, oh, I'm just blessed and highly favored. <laughs> I'm just fine. I'm so good. So good. We, our marriage is great. You're like, you're a bunch of liars. By the way, that's why Katie and I drive separate cars. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, okay? I get here a lot earlier than her, all right? But you see, this is where small groups come into play. Small groups come when you've had intimate connections with other people in the church that you've had tight relationships with, that you're walking through life with. You walk in and you're like, you know what? Our marriage is struggling right now. You know what? Parenting is hard. Who wants some kids? Right? They're for sale. Right? Like that's, you're saying those real things. Don't look at me, Oscar. You know you've all thought it. The small groups are like, when we come together, like, man, life, I'm really struggling. I need help right now. And that's when that small group turns and says, hey, we love you guys. Come on in. Tell us about it because we want to help you with the grace and compassion and love of Jesus. See, we all need to gather in corporate worship in the temple. But we all need to gather in small groups in the homes. You see, we're all born with an intense desire to be accepted by a group. But these groups join together to continue on mission together. Our corporate worship and small group gatherings are designed to let us walk closely together so that we can attack the darkness with the gospel. Some of you are here right now and you're like, well, how do I join this group? How do I become a part of this missional movement of God? You know, you know how I know you're asking that question is because the same people in this text were also asking the questions. The people in this text are watching the church just be the church, exalt Jesus, give generously, gather together, and they were walking up like, why are y'all doing that? Y'all look crazy, but it's really interesting how crazy y'all look. Why are you being this way? Why are you giving to one another? Why are you loving each other? Why are you walking with each other? Why are you, why are you getting up on Sunday mornings to go to a 9.30 a.m. Sunday school class? And then they would turn and say, well, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what Jesus has done to me. And when Jesus brought me from his sin, he brought me into a community of my family, my brothers and my sisters in Christ. You know how I know that they were asking that question in this text? Because look at the end of verse 47. Because the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. You see, when the church is just being the church, God's people will see it, other people will see it, and God, they will want to be a part of it. And they get open to the gospel. So my question to you is, how do you join this movement? Well, everybody joins this movement by first trusting in Jesus Christ. Turn from sin and trust in Jesus' final payment, and once 
you do that by faith and you get plugged into a body of believers and you join the movement with us. So here we come to the end today and I want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. You know, some of you last week were here and you decided not to raise your hands for whatever reason. You got scared, you got cold feet. And you told God this week, you almost even put out like a missionary calling, like, God, if you give me another chance, I'll say yes. So I'm going to give you a chance to say yes today. Here's that second chance, because I believe God is a God of second chances. Without anyone looking around, if you're ready to join God's people by turning from sin and trusting in, the G- in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, indicate that by raising your hand. All right, I got you. I got you three. Listen, some of you, I, get, I put out a call to put baptize out there. Say, join this community by showing the world your faith in Christ by getting baptized. Some of you, you maybe got cold feet. And I ask you to consider joining by being dunked in the waters of baptism. We had two respond last week to baptism. But some of you in there, maybe you were like, I should have responded. Well, let me ask you to raise your hand if you're ready to follow Jesus by being obedient to his command of being baptized. If you're ready to get baptized today, raise your hand. Now, lastly, raise your hand if you're ready to join FPC Holland to become a part of the spirit-led moving of doing whatever it takes to draw people closer to Jesus. If you're saying, Jeremy, I'm ready to join this church and be a part of the spirit-led movement, show me that you're interested in having that conversation by raising your hand. Gotcha, gotcha. You may put them down. Lastly, FBC Holland. Indicate by raising your hand just a moment if you're willing to commit to this local body to be a movement, to be a movement of disciple making disciples. Saying, Jeremy, we're going to dedicate ourselves to corporate worship, we're going to dedicate ourselves to Sunday school, and we are going to dedicate ourselves to taking the good news of Jesus right here in Holland to the ends of the earth. FEC Hall, if you're willing to make that commitment, indicate that by, sh- by raising your hand right now. Raise your hand high. I see all across this room. Let us be a movement of disciple-making disciples for the glory of God and the advancement of His kingdom. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for all those hands that were raised in this time. Lord, I pray that as we grow, we don't just grow to maintain the growth. We grow to just be a movement be like the early church, to exalt Christ and take Jesus to the people. That we give of ourselves and our generosity to put every dollar that you have given us towards a mission. And that mission is to be a part of the movement of advancing the kingdom to the ends of the earth. And then lastly, Lord, I pray that we would commit ourselves, commit ourselves together in corporate worship and in Sunday school to walk through life together, to encourage one another, but then to push each other out. To push each other out to take on the world of darkness with the light of the gospel. Lord, this church is indicated by raising their hands that they want to be a movement of disciple-making disciples. So Lord, fill us with your spirit continually. Use us with the power of your spirit to be your witnesses throughout our Jerusalems, in our Judea, in our Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand and sing together in this time of response. I believe you gave sight to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. I believe there were wonders inside. I believe in the world that you say. I believe in the sky and earth. That your goodness is good for that. will never change. I will sing of your honors. Sing of your grace. God of creation. Love me by name.